All right, come on in, everybody. Grab a virtual seat. Welcome to another presentation of the online Cold Fusion Meetup. I'm Charlie Earhart, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And this edition of the Meetup, our 283rd, being recorded on Thursday, February 25th, 2021, at noon U.S. Eastern, we've got Sean Oden, who's going to give us his talk, The Golden Hammer, Confessions of a Recovering Database Abuser. So with that, welcome, Sean. Thanks for coming on, and I will switch it over to you. Thank you. you bet. Sounds sounds great. Um, so this this talk is the uh, the Golden Hammer uh, Confessions of Recovering Database Abuser, uh, which is what I used to be. Uh, one of the things, uh, basically, if you've never heard the the term the Golden Hammer, it, it comes from uh, essentially, I guess it's it's uh, known as Maslow's Law, and it, it says. Essentially, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Um, so you tend to tend to solve things with what you know. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Uh, so who am I? Um, my, again, like Charlie said, my name is Sean Oden. I started my professional life in a completely different area. I was a pilot. Uh, for a little while, uh, going down that path, and then uh, accidentally became a Java developer for about 15 minutes, enough to say hello world, and then got shifted over to a layer cold fusion uh, back in around the 4.5 day or 4.0, 4.5 days. Um, and then over the course of the years, that was back in probably 2000, over the course of the year since then, I've kind of started doing more SQL. Uh, or just, I guess, the, the incidental SQL stuff. And then that just kind of translated into a little bit more. And I've, I've always had the fault of being a rather curious person. And, and I've learned over the years that, that if you ask about how things work, then before you know it, you become the expert, uh, <laughs> the subject matter expert in those things. Um, so sometimes it's better just to sh shut up and ask no questions. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the last several months, uh, Right now, I'm, I'm currently working as a DBA. The last several months, I've been working on doing some, some SQL certifications, uh, the Microsoft MCSEs and MCSAs. Um, just trying to move along that path. I'm still a Cold Fusion fanboy, so I try to stick around and do what I can with that. Um, most of my experience, again, has been in the Microsoft flavor. I know that that some of the things that, that – well, most of the things that I'm saying here are – going to be standard SQL stuff. There is, uh, again, my, my main focus is with Microsoft's T-SQL. Uh, so Oracle uh, or MySQL or Postgres may do something slightly different, but they're still all based on the SQL standard. So the first thing uh, to remember when doing anything with databases is never, ever, ever test in production. Um, we used to do that a lot lot more than we do now, but you will absolutely regret it uh, if you do any tests because things that cannot happen actually will happen. Um, the next thing I learned really, uh, we had a, a small database or a, we had our database uh, was roughly several thousand rows. Um, and uh, when we were growing, or it was a sh small million rows when we were growing, um, we, we started writing reporting stuff from our production database. And, and it, it very quickly turned into a situation when our database grew to multiple millions of rows, tens of millions of rows. Um, our reporting started impacting our normal production systems. Um, so it would make our data entry slow down uh, because our reports were just, just beating up on it. So one thing you would want to do if you have a lot of reporting on a large database is just sp basically spin up another database, a copy of your production database, and then do the reporting queries off of that. That way you're not interfering with your data entry because your data entry is always going to be more important than the reporting on it. Um, the, the third thing, the third rule, I guess, really, that, that you want to keep in mind when working with SQL is that, that and really with anything, um, backups, you have to take your backups, but they are absolutely worthless if you never test them. Uh, the one thing you do not want to do is uh, figure out that you've been backing up a bad database uh, for the last several months when something dies and you have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to do a restore. 
um, and you, you, you don't want to find that. Uh, that that's a really bad time to to try to work with that kind of problem. Um, and again, when when it comes to to the database stuff, there's it's it's just like most programming things. There's really really no hard and fast actual rules. It almost always depends. There's there's very strict guide or very strong guidelines. Uh, but they sometimes don't exactly fit. You have to be able to recognize when they're not appropriate. Uh, but really, actually, the, to, to correct myself, the only one one hard and fast rule is don't test in production. Um, and that's really kind of an unwritten rule. That's just personal experience. You will regret it. So a couple of things that we're going to talk about today. Well, what is the what is SQL uh, and then how I learned that, that database databases have grown so significantly since I have uh, I first started. Uh, they're they're a lot more complex. They can do a lot more things. Um, they're still used fairly simply uh, by by a lot of, of uh, organizations, and and they can do a lot more than they do. Um, some of the bad things that that I, some of the bad habits I got into. Uh, I'll talk about those, and then some of the gotchas that we run into. Um, there's, it's just SQL, the more I've dug into it, the, the larger of a topic that, that I've realized it really is. There, there are people that are, are significant experts in different, in some areas. Um, and, uh, they don't know, they, they, they don't know very much about others still within the database system. So it's just, it's, it's a broad topic. So the first, first thing is. What, what exactly is it? Uh, according to the actual dictionary definition of it, it's just an industry standard language for creating, updating, and querying relational database management systems. Um, and it's, or it's a domain, according to the Wikipedia, a little less than, than uh, official definition, I guess. It's a domain specific language used in programming design for managing data to help in relational database management systems, blah, 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 blah. The important thing to know, though, is uh really is it sql or is it uh sql um it used to be it was first originally sql uh, but then there were some lawsuits involved in that name being already taken and so it was changed to just uh, sql but sql kind of stuck around um so it's really it can be both it, it doesn't really matter I, I use them pretty much interchangeably i, I use them I use both of them quite often uh, in either way. Um, it doesn't, it just simply, it's the same same thing. So now that now that we've gotten the great dictionary definition, uh, what, what actually is it? Um, really, it's nothing more than just a way to talk to your data, um, to ask your database what it is that, that you want to be able to interact with it and, and get back what you need from it. Uh, one of the things that makes uh, SQL different than, than most other programming languages, though, is it is a declarative language instead of an imperative language. Uh, this was probably the biggest shift that I had to make uh, when uh, just thinking about how to write it. Because with uh, SQL, you, you don't tell it how to do things. You just ask it for things. Um, so uh, I guess a really good, really good uh, example of that that I've always scene was like just a simple sandwich. You know, if you're programming how to write a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you'd have to program out all the steps for taking out the bread and getting the knife and all and all that. But with SQL, you just say, hey, I need a sandwich. Um, and then you ask, OK, I've got a bread table. I've got a jelly table. I've got a peanut butter table. And you, you learn how to make all those join together. And then you say where, you know, my sandwich is a peanut butter sandwich. And then they, it'll make all those things happen for you. Um, it's mainly used to just get get information from your back end systems and then bring it back to your front end systems for the display. The the SQL system itself on the back end, a lot of things that it stores you may not they may not look the it, they may not store it exactly the way that it looks when it gets to, to the ultimate screen. Um, but you got to store it somewhere. Um, they're also incredibly they're they're getting significantly smarter than they used to be. They they are very good at figuring out what you want based on what you ask it. However, they're also uh, they're they're not complete mind readers yet. 
Um, so they do, if you give it bad information or, or give it bad data or tell it the wrong way to do something, then it's going to give you the wrong results. And that's not the database's fault. Uh, you just, part of, part of SQLing is, is learning how to ask it specifically for what it is that you want. And again, uh, databases have gotten incredibly complex. They do a lot more now than just holding your data. Um, most databases have a very, very robust schema uh, security system now uh, for managing users, managing the, the data access, um, so that, that essentially, if, if you don't have permissions to look at the, some data, you, it doesn't even exist to you. Uh, and that's all handled at the database level. Um, it also has, they also, most of them have, have really good encryption uh, schemas built in. So there are schemes built in so that, that any data that you are storing, you can make it so that, that if somebody were to walk in and grab your, your drive that holds your database, they aren't going to be able to read anything. Um, they're pretty, pretty significantly strong um, at doing, doing a lot of that stuff. Uh, your database also has the ability to do your backups of the database and to help provide redundancy. There's there's all sorts of ways that can that it can work on that. Um, a lot of the the database systems use their own dialect. They their their SQL itself is a standard. Uh, it's a it's a ISO standard uh, that that constantly evolves. So. Any of these database systems like Postgres or MySQL or T-SQL have to follow um, the standard at their base end, but then they can always they they always add in stuff, uh, make make things happen a little bit better, but or, or a little bit their way, uh, but they still ultimately happen the same way. Um, most SQL that that you'll come across um, as a developer is mostly going to be the crud type stuff. It's going to be the create reads, updates, and deletes. Um, and that's where you really have to watch out for things because the mindset really is you have to change the way that you look at SQL because SQL is more set-based than it is um, individual row-based. So your, uh, your queries that might work on a few hundred rows uh, they might return, um, and you're really fast. You're not going to notice that that it takes, you know, uh, uh, two milliseconds longer to to do this this one operation when you've got a few hundred rows. But when you're talking about a few million rows times, you know, a couple of milliseconds, that that adds up quite a bit. And then one of the things again that that I really had to wrap my head around uh, when. Uh, SQL query, uh, writing SQL queries, is that that I am used to. Uh, I was used to doing basically top to bottom programming. So if, if what I had up at the top would be the first thing processed, and then it would work its way down in the system. Uh, whereas with SQL, it doesn't really work like that. You might write a select uh, select x from this, give it an eight, give that column an alias uh, from your table, and then but you can't reference that uh, alias that you've created in some parts of your query itself, because with a SQL query, it, it essentially processes the froms first. It builds where you're building that data from, and then it does your your filtering from there. And then it does your grouping, uh, and then then it does selecting is actually one of the the later things that it does. So you don't even have access to anything that it's already selected until way late in the process. So that's why you can't use a uh, alias that you've created in a where clause, but you can use it in an order by clause, even though the order by clause is written after the where clause. Uh, and then um, really, I guess it helps when, when you're trying to figure out what it is that it's actually doing, looking at this order that is logically processed. Um, it helps you figure out uh, like why you're getting the rows in your top or in your offset fetch. Um, why those orders are coming about, or why those 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 records are coming about, where you've uh, done the select. So, next up is some of the things that that I have seen that I didn't realize. I guess were really bad. Uh, probably one of the most common uh, common types of of SQL that you'll come across is using select star. 
Um, Select Star is it's easy uh, because you don't have to remember all the tables, and uh, it it happens uh, it happens quite a bit. Sorry. So, but but one thing that that it, it maybe it's maybe doing behind the backgrounds uh, behind the scenes that you don't realize is that that you're selecting a lot more than you need, uh, and you may not need the entire table. Uh, yeah, or you may not need rather the entire set of columns. Um, you may only need two columns from that that uh, table, but with a select star, you're ha you're selecting every single one of them. So that's a lot more work that the database has to do to build put those columns together. That's a lot more work that the network has to do to push that that data back uh, over, and then that's a lot more work that your application has to do to process the data that you've given it. Um, it can also select star can also make your uh, an incorrect index be used uh, because an in indexes are fairly specific. They're kind of like a card catalog in a uh, in a library. You know, they they help uh, they help the database look up the data that that it you're trying to look at uh, with and it ignores the data that you don't care about. Uh, but when you select every column that you don't need, then it may be looking at another index. You may have multiple indexes on a table. So it may be looking at the wrong index because you're asking it for those columns and you may not want them. You're going to throw them away later, but it still has to, to go through and find, figure out what index that you need for that. That can also cause the bad query plan to be, to be made for that. So that the next time you ask for that, um, it doesn't, it queries the exact same bad way the next time you ask. Um, and the other thing that the really dangerous thing that can happen is that if the underlying columns change with a select star, you're not really giving it any anything. Um, so it's just going to return them back in the way that the, the columns are selected. Um, so you may not get basically your your uh, column may be deleted and with a select star you may not notice it until it gets all the way back to your application and your application breaks um so you definitely don't want to do that the best thing to do uh, with selecting is just explicitly label the columns that you want um and that way you you make sure that you do all the things that you need you're only you're only pulling the the data that you need you're not running any extra processing that you don't need um, you're not having to, to yank across any any data that you don't need. Um, and you know specifically what you're getting back uh, in your query. Another thing that I've seen, um, and I'll make a confession here, this is something that I, I said I needed to look at the first time I did this back in May, and then I never did. Um, but it's something that I've used for pretty much the entire time that I've been writing Cold Fusion. It's a lot of times you only need to grab the first number of rows um, from a query. Uh, and CF Query has a really, or rather Cold Fusion has a really great uh, attribute in their, their CF Query called the max rows attribute that lets you say, I only want to get 42 rows from this query. Uh, the problem is that, that it's gotten a lot better uh, when it moved into the, the being a Java based instead of a C based application. Uh, but the problem with max rows is still cold fusion. You probably won't notice anything on the application side of things um, because it's still the the when cold fusion sends a CF query, it, it uh, contacts the JDBC um, or it talks to the JDBC that sends a query. It sends your query over, and then the the JDBC handles those results. And it's smart enough to say, okay, I've got 42 results back from my database already. I don't care about the rest, so return it. Whereas, you know, Cold Fusion is done with the query, but the database itself may still be really looking at um, all of those records, depending on how, you, how you've how uh, written the query and all that. So the, the best thing to do is, is if you need to limit rows, uh, limit them on the database themselves. Uh, and then again, this is something that, that each, D, each DBMS does different ways, uh, select top, well, works in SQL Server, but top is a SQL Server specific. Um, something like MySQL, you might use a limit clause. Uh, SQL Server does have, uh, I believe they do have offset and, and fetch now. Um, there, there's what different ways to limit uh, the rows, the number of rows that you return from the query, but it's better to do it on the query side because the database will 
limit those rows instead of having just sending back everything and letting the application deal with it. Another thing that, that you'll come across is basically like you want to um, figure out what the last record inserted was. Um, if you're working as a, if you're single threaded, that's not a problem because you're you can be pretty well assured that when you're running the query under a single thread that if you insert something and you immediately select from that table, you're going to get the row you that you just inserted. However, if you've got multiple people working on a database, like pretty much any web application is going to going to have more than one user, um, hopefully, um, then what could happen is you could in that very, very tiny amount of time between that first query where you've inserted the data and the, the next query where you've selected the data, you could still get a um, somebody else inserted a, a, core, a record into that day table. So when you select, you're selecting their most recent uh, record. And that may not be what you want, or that's probably not what you want. Um, so it's really bad for, for doing... Um, any kind of any kind of concurrency or anything like that. Um, there's several database specific ways to deal with that, um, but fortunately, Cold Fusion has a very very simple method. You just name your query, uh, give it a result, and inside your result, it gives you a generated key. And when it returns the the whatever information that you or whatever action you've done, um, so. Uh, and that'll give you the actual last record that, that was inserted in that query itself. So you don't have to worry about any sort of concurrency going wrong there. Another thing that, that really, um, it, it's probably one of the code smells that I see uh, that I immediately look at to try to figure out a better way to do something is, is any kind of looping over a query. Um, Cold Fusion does have connection pooling that, that kind of works to mitigate some of this, uh, some other languages may not have the same sort of thing. But basically, every time you query a database, you're creating a new connection. Um, and connect, creating a connection is incredibly slow. It takes a lot of time. So if you're looping for a thousand uh, index, or you're looping over you know multiple thousands of rows, you're making multiple thousands of, of connections uh, to that database, which is going to really slow it down. Some of the better ways uh, that you can actually get that exact same data is you can either query the bulk of it, uh, again, query it in a set, um, get your data back in that set, and then just use your application to loop over the results of that query rather than lo looping into the, over that query multiple times. And a very similar problem is when you need to use one query to pull data from another query. So like you've got, you're selecting a list of IDs and then you're using that list of IDs to um, basically run another, basically feed another query uh, that you're running. Um, again, that's just another loop over queries and, and all of the, the bad things that, that I talked about in the previous slide still apply. Um, a better way that you really, I mean, a lot, and again, I guess again, a lot of it is is used, if, especially if you're used building a nested list or high or some sort of hierarchical data. Uh, but that it can have a huge impact on performance. Any kind of looping over a query can have a huge impact. Um, a lot of that can be done with just proper joining of a query, and again, making. Uh, I get with with, with making a. a just a join would, would give you a much better set of data uh, together to work with. So this, this kind of leads to one of the, probably one of the, the best things you can learn about uh, as far as if you're working with any kind of data is how to properly do joins. Um, these can, these can help you get the data that you need, the right data that you need in the right way. And, and again, minimize the data that you're pulling back. Uh, so that you're only getting you're only getting just what you need, and you're not getting a whole bunch of extra stuff that you're only gonna you're gonna end up throwing away. Um, probably the biggest type of joins that that you'll see are an inner join, which is just a it's it's taking two tables and just pulling up the the common records uh, between the two, um, and then dropping anything else. 
Um, or you might have an outer join, which they, they come in left and right flavors, depending on which table you, you're trying to make as the main table. And this will pull all the records from one table and then only the matched rows from the other table and the unmatched rows will just get nulls. Um, as far as left or right, I personally, my, my view is that, that because, I, again, because I read from left to right, it probably makes more sense to me. Uh, the, I, I prefer the left joins. And most times I've found that a right join, a right outer join is just a other type of join, a left join maybe that was just written wrong, uh, started with the wrong table. So it can usually be better to make a little bit more sense. And that's the that's usually the important thing is you want the you want your queries to actually make sense to the developers, uh, just like any kind of code. Um, another type is a full join, which essentially does exactly what it sounds like it is. It takes all the records from both tables, and then uh, it matches the ones that can be matched, and it returns null data for anyone that, that cannot be matched. Um, the, and the last one, really, uh, a cross join, it's something that you really want to try to not do. Um, they do have their purposes, but uh, you're essentially matching every row in table A to every row in table B. So if you have, uh, you know, uh, 10 rows in table A and you have 10 rows in table B, you're going to end up with 100 results. Um, you may not want that. that. That's a Cartesian product. When you're especially talking about one of the one of the, the very important lessons I learned about cross joining, especially accidental cross joining, um, I joined a 10 million row table to a 40 million row table uh, in a cross in an accidental cross join. I didn't even know that I'd done it until the database, the DBA, came to me and said, "Hey, Sean, uh, did you know that we only have about 16 gigabytes of memory in that database?" <laughs> and I said, no. Um, so a cross join will wipe out your database and it will make your DBA come to see you pretty quickly. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of other types of joins uh, that you can get into um, that, again, it's it's a big topic and it's one that you really should dig into if you want to work with data uh, in a good way. Um, this is a common uh Illustration, I guess, that you'll see uh, that kind of goes over the different types of joins. Um, it covers covers a little bit and shows you how to use the the the, the left and right joins to do a is null to remove uh, data that you don't want uh, pulled into that, and it's much faster than like doing like a not in or something like that. Uh, but th that's just a an illustration of some of the joins that you, that you might see. Some of uh, my personal views on joins uh, inside the join clause itself, um, that's where I do things where I link the tables together. Uh, and again, the, the goal is to get the smallest amount of data together that you can uh, to work with. You don't want to work with a bunch of data that you don't need. And then the where clause is what I use for filtering the results out of after the whole query has built itself. Um, so, uh, like, for instance, uh, table two, I want to filter it only for, for buyer ID 42 here in my example. So I would I would include that in the in the join part itself, because that way I'm only joining those records on table two that I'm already know I'm going to filter out everything else and then join those to table one. I don't have to worry about anything else. But then when I get to the end of that that data set, I have to filter out for their specific customer and then I can do that. Uh, with that that customer ID there. Uh, so again, again, that's personal personal opinion or personal preference, I guess. You can filter uh, or you can join in the where clause. It's just not uh, it's not as efficient um, as it could be. And then the other thing, probably one of again one of my biggest pet peeves of SQL databases is the old style ANSI eighty nine joins. I don't see these as much now as I used to. Um, but using like a common delimited join on tables, um, these are, they, they essentially create a Cartesian product and then filter down the Cartesian product for specifically what you want. Uh, they, uh, they're incredibly inefficient and they will drive you crazy. Uh, plus it's been deprecated. So, and then Microsoft is a little bit better about actually removing things that have been deprecated than, than 
Adobe is or Alaya or whoever or, uh, Macromedia was. So you're not going to see a deprecated parameter exist last 20 years uh, in single server. So some of the gotchas that, that I've run into also with uh, one thing that you might notice is that, that if you run a lot of uh, queries, especially concurrent queries, uh, you might see that that you might see some blocking going on. And so one of the things that, that we did before we saw this, we we're like, oh, no lock. No lock is great because that way my query won't be blocked anymore. And yes, that works for that query, but it doesn't really do what you think it's doing, first of all, uh, because no lock is, is essentially reading uncommitted data. It's a, it's a read uncommitted transaction. Uh, so you're getting dirty reads. You're reading data that, that may disappear or, or it may change. Uh, it hasn't been committed yet. Um, so so you don't want to do that. It, if it's gone and you, you could be doing counts, you could be doing business transactions uh, that, that re, uh, require that data and then they're they're gone uh, because there was a mistake in it and whoever did rolled that their query out. So no lock, it, it basically keeps your query from being uh, basically uh, blocked, but it doesn't necessarily uh, keep your query from blocking other queries. Uh, so especially we consider, too, that Microsoft's default is to, to read committed. Reading uncommitted data is not always what you want. It's not good. It's better to explicitly do that. Uh, no, no lock is a Band-Aid that, that really... Um, it has a few places, but it can cause a lot of trouble uh, if you don't fully understand what it is that it's doing. Another thing that you'll run into is uh, type conversion or, or unintentional type conversion, maybe for something like this. And th this is actually very common in something like Cold Fusion that is a dynamic language. Um, you know, one as a character and one as a string are the exact same thing to Cold Fusion. Um, however, uh, in SQL, they 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 may not be the exact same thing, uh, depending on how you can uh, compare them. So you just have to watch out for that kind of stuff. A lot of types, a lot of different types, will explicitly convert or sorry, implicitly convert uh, to other types, uh, which can run into issues that you may not um, you may not intend for them to happen. Uh, you know, certain numbers can turn into strings. Certain strings can turn into numbers. Um, Dates are probably the biggest one that you'll see because a date, if it's stored improperly, can be stored as a string. Um, and it may or may not convert to a number or a date. It, it just uh, basically you don't want to you don't want to accidentally con uh, do something, do some sort of combining in the back or reading, comparing in the back. Uh, that that it's not really too too. You're comparing. You may be comparing apples to oranges, but you may be comparing an orange-looking apple. Uh, you, you don't want to do that. Also, with implicit conversions, you do run into a little bit of overhead because the database has to say, "Ooh, what they meant was," and and convert that that thing to whatever it's trying to compare to. Um, this can also happen uh, where you're joining two things together, uh, so you'd have to watch out for that. Um, you want to make sure that, that you're comparing. Anytime you're comparing two things together, you want to make sure that they're the same data type uh, before you compare them, uh, because that way they'll they'll essentially assure that they're doing the right thing. Plus, it's, again, it's you're being clear that you know what it is that you're doing. Uh, again, another common chart that you'll see uh, is the different types of things that can, that, uh, can uh, combine or that can compare to each other um, or, th or things that can't, things that will uh, require explicitly being converted or things that will ex implicitly convert that will change without you having to look at it. <coughs> Sorry. Or things that simply aren't allowed, like you can't, you can't convert a binary value into a float value. As far as data types go, probably one of the most common things that you'll run into, one of the common, most common uh, data types you'll run into is character data types. Uh, any sort of strings or anything like that. 
Um, these are also the most easily abused uh, in SQL injection because that's how you would really SQL inject something, uh, making something look like what it's not supposed to be. Um, so you, uh, I mean, it's a little bit more difficult to inject into a, a numeric field because there's very limited number of values you can throw in there. But whereas a, a character field, depending on what how you're limiting it, you may be able to put all sorts of characters in there. Uh, the characters can also be uh, either fixed width, uh, with a char or, or variable width, uh, with a var like a varchar. Um, ultimately, when they're compared, they're still compared to the same thing. So you still have to watch out for the side, the storage spaces for those. Um, there's also the really big ones like text and in-text. Those are old. They have been deprecated. Please do not use those. Um, they do have better uh, better data types that you can use now for the, those types of values. Um, those also do come with their own uh, limitations or cautions, I guess. Again, when you're building a database, uh, you, you want to make sure that, that you build it, you size it correctly. I mean, you don't want to give... Um, if you're storing a row of or a table of of state names or state abbreviations, you don't want to create the two-digit abbreviation column um, as a Varkar max uh, because that's just an incredible amount of wasted data that you don't need. Um, you and then where you see the N in those, um, that's not the number of characters; that's the number of bytes that it can. Uh, it can take. So again, you can see, and you can see that you know some characters, especially when you get into the to the ask uh, the uh, some of the extended characters, they can take more than more than one byte to store that their their value in. Um, so that's why you see the the Unicodes, the the in chars or in var chars. Uh, they uh, those numbers can only be smaller. Uh, that they're about half the size of a regular bar char. And then that table kind of lists the, the number of bytes that they actually can take up to. So you can see how using just just randomly using var car max can really eat up a lot of space. Another thing that, that you'll see a lot of is, uh, especially with like var chars, uh, just you don't specify the end. Uh, you do, because it's just easy uh, to to write it out and you don't think about it. So you'll you'll say just you know create me a table. I want column one to be a varchar. Uh, because you didn't specify length in those situations. Anytime anytime you declare something or or create something like that in T SQL and I believe in that may be a SQL standard. It defaults it to do a length of one. So that means you're only storing one single character. In that field, it will truncate, or actually won't truncate. It'll give you an error if you try to insert anything into those fields. Now, the dangerous one though is when you cast or convert something, uh, because those are uh, in SQL Server, those default to 30 bytes, and you could cast something as a varchar without a def without a uh, length assigned to it. And if it's 32 characters wide or 32 bytes wide, you might uh, truncate it two of those characters off and that that's going to be a silent error that you're not going to notice and that could be that could be really bad those are probably silent errors are much worse than than ones that say hey i broke uh, because it may be incredibly difficult to troubleshoot something that you never knew broke another thing that that uh, you'll run into with the character di uh, data types uh, is with uh, when doing comparisons uh, especially with fixed width uh, columns, uh, you want to make sure that you're providing the, the best width, uh, the proper width for, for your comparison. You don't want to compare if a column is only three two characters wide. You don't want to compare a five character wide column to it because there's going to be padded characters in there and it's not going to match. Um, and then uh, the SQL rules themselves, not, not T SQL or anything, just the, the standard SQL rules say that when you compare strings, the strings, uh, when you compare two strings, they have to be equal in length uh, to be able to compare. And so what it will do is the SQL standard says, 
trim off any trailing white space, and then pad white space for the smallest one uh, on the left side to be the same same width as the the one on the right or the the larger one. So you could end up uh, basically the you could end up trying to compare something that looks like it's only three characters, but it's actually five characters. Uh, and uh, or you could compare something that that has a bunch of trailing spaces. You just want it to you, you basically want to ma- want it to match, and you got to keep those things in mind when you're doing the comparison. The next type uh, is is numbers. These are ex- exact numbers like integers. Um, they're always going to be represented completely. They're always going to be like one point one plus two is always going to be three. Um, it's going to be a whole number. An integer is a whole number. Um, when, but when you can, when you uh, do any sort of conver- uh, coercion from a decimal, like to an integer, a decimal may have uh, a place, uh, a number of decimal points after it. But then when you convert it to an integer, it's going to round that that up to the integer based on whatever rounding rules that you have. The important thing to remember here too with integers when you're storing them in a database is to, to, again, use the size that you're going to need. Uh, and, and you can see how big a difference it could be. Um, so if you're storing, again, if you're storing 50 states in a table and you need a, you need a primary key uh, incremented value for those, then, then you don't need to store it as an int and use four bytes for each row when you can store it as a tiny int and use one byte for each row. Um, with a, with a regular int, you can go all the way up to to basically 2.1 billion rows or billion numbers, or negative 2.1 billion numbers. Then when you get into the big ants, you can get into some really ridiculously large numbers. Um, but they're also again they come with a, the cost of, of larger storage size. Use what you need uh, because again with with uh, 100 rows, it's not a big deal. But when you get to 100 million rows, then a single byte adds up quite a lot at that point. With decimals, decimals are still an exact number. Uh, so if you do a 0.1 plus a 0.2, you're still going to get a 0.3. Uh, but you have to de- you have to declare the precision. You have to de- declare the scale of a decimal. Uh, by default, if you don't declare anything, uh, the default is 38 and 0. So you could have a 38 uh Number wide, uh, the I guess a character wide number with a, a decimal of zero. Um, when it comes down to it, though, n- n- you'll see numeric and decimal data types. Those are essentially the same things. Um, where you want to again, you you want to use the size that you you need because when you specify a, a decimal uh, twenty four whatever, and you're requiring 13 bytes for each each column or each row of the column for that dot, uh, type. If you're not using 13 bytes, then specify it smaller and, and use it, uh, use less space. Now, the ones that really will drive you absolutely nuts are the approximate uh, numbers. Um, those are the floats and the reels. Um, they are. They have their place. They're they're for representing very, very, very large numbers or very, very small numbers. Um, but they can be very surprising if you don't know what it is that that. Or they can give you some unexpected results. Like if you're using floats, a point one and a point two aren't going to be a point three. They're going to be a point three with a whole bunch of zeros and then a four, and that's going to drive you absolutely nuts because when you try to compare that, it doesn't match. Um, again, they do, they do have their, their purpose, uh, just be careful when you use them and, and know that they are not exact numbers. They are, they are approximate numbers. They're, they're designed to work with the decimal system, uh, that, that, or I'm sorry, the binary system that, that computers were built on. Um, uh, and you cannot represent every number binarily. Uh, the way that, that you can with the exact numbers. With the decimal numbers, it gets a little bit trickier. So just watch for that. And then a real is essentially a float 24. So watch for those. Now, we get to probably my absolute least favorite of all the data types, and that would be dates. 
Uh, there are roughly a bazillion different ways to represent a date. Uh, every uh, every time zone has a different date. Uh, every everybody seems i mean every country seems to have its own different representation of how you do dates so they've actually created an, an iso standard of 8601 to say this is the way that a date is officially going to be represented we're going to do a year a four digit year and then a two digit month and then a two digit day and it's always going to be this is what it means so if you get um you know a, a one two uh you never have to worry about is this that January 2nd or is it February 1st? Uh, it's always going to be, you know, the, the, if you've done, if you've done it in an isotype format, then it's always going to be the one, two, uh, the January 1st. Um, one of the other things that you'll run into with the dates is a date is stored in a database. Uh, it's not stored like you would normally expect to see it. it it's stored as like some big gigantic number of, of some sort of time tick since the, the, the epoch of that system. Um, for SQL Server and most, most Microsoft products, that might be a number of ticks since uh, January 1st of 1900, or it might be uh, on Unix-ish type systems, it, it's going to be January 1, 1, 1970. Um, some systems, again, it also comes in at December 31st, 1969. So any, the epoch can be different for anything. The dates, dates are just they can they can. It's best to use date objects instead of strings, but you have to be careful with them uh, because there there is a lot of room for ambiguity and a lot of room for making mistakes with dates. Um, you also have to watch out when converting them to, to strings. Um, again, you want to make sure you're doing the right right thing with uh again and the data types um you get uh you got to watch out for the the precision and all that because i know microsoft date time runs at like 0 0.003 millisecond point something milliseconds so you can get the incorrect date uh if, when you're doing comparisons and that you may not intend to also because of integers the way that that most most systems are, are running off of a Unix-ish type calendar where 1-1-1970 is the baseline and, and then we're um, counting a number of millisecond ticks or second, rather second ticks since 1-1-1970. Uh, and, and that means that because we're using a 32-bit integer, uh, we're going to run out of integers uh, on roughly... Uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.14 in the morning on January 19, 2038. Um, it's just like we already did in, in Y2K when computers were screwed up by using two-digit, four-digit not dates. Uh, when, when we get to 2038 and we roll over uh, that uh, number of ticks, the, the number of ticks is going to roll back to the negative numbers. So we're going to have a completely wrong date on that day. So there's going to be a lot of really, just like there was Y2K, there'll be a lot of really smart people working on the problem and probably converting us to all be using 64-bit dates by then. Um, but the, the thing to keep in mind really is that 2038 isn't that far away. Um, we're a lot closer to 2038 now than we were when I first started doing this back in 2000. A couple other things to think about with uh, SQL Server is uh, there, there's a, a term called rebar. Um, and it was coined by Jeff Moden years ago. It was, uh, it's, it stands for row by agonizing row. And that's because SQL is designed to be set based. It's not designed to, to work on a law, on a single row at a time. Uh, when, when you work on a, basically a batch of rows, it, it, it you can do uh, multiple actions on a row or on a set of data faster than you can do each row at a time. And that can, uh, that can really, if you're doing each row at a time, that can really slow things down. It can break indexes, make the incorrect uh, indexes being used. Um, so you want to try to avoid rebar as much as you can. 
uh, one of the handy things that most database engines now are using too are common table expressions. Uh, MySQL started using them in a version eight. I don't think the version fives use them, uh, but they are essentially a way to build up a temporary table uh, to use within the main query, and it disappears as soon as the query is complete. Um, you can use them only in the select. Uh, insert updates and deletes, and it also must be terminated. Uh, it must be the first statement in a batch, rather. So one thing I always do is I always drop a semicolon in front of it to make sure that anything else that was running, if it, that code gets pulled in any other SQL application or SQL uh, code, it is it, that code is, is terminated before my, my CTE runs, so I don't get an error. Another really great thing that, that is introduced, has been introduced, is winning functions. They basically give you a way to aggregate your data inside some kind of, of a specific window within your query. Uh, they make it very simple to do things like running totals or um, other things like that that you might have previously had to use multiple uh, subqueries to do. Um, it just it's a it's a good way again to to do pull some aggregate data. There's a lot of good tricks that you can do to to get things that you need out of those. Another thing to think about is between is probably a common filter uh, used, uh, but the thing to remember about between is that you've got to know uh, it's somewhat it's somewhat of an ambiguous term. Uh, you've got to know what what it actually means. Uh, in in SQL Server, between is inclusive of both sides. So if if you say something like again between one and four. Um, you might think that it would take anything larger than four, or you might mean for it to take anything larger than four, than one, anything smaller than four. Uh, but it doesn't. It'll include one, and it'll also include four. Um, especially when you start dealing with dates, uh, that that's probably where you'll see it the most. Is where where between, you know, like January first and January thirty first. Um, but that's what you intend. Uh, or rather, you you know, you only want to select the, the the days that are in January. It's much better to be very explicit rather than using a between. Uh, say where, when you say something like where where uh, y is greater than or equal to x and y is less than or equal to z, then you know that you are including x and z in that uh, calculation. It's also very good again. We're going to harp on being explicit some more. Don't use the shorthand. Uh, it lets you, um, you can do this in Cold Fusion too, and I don't uh, don't advocate for using any kind of shorthand when it comes to dates. Uh, but if you do something like date part Y of, of the today's date, it doesn't give you, um, it doesn't give you what you expect. A Y in, in SQL Server is not, a year, like what you mean. It's the day of the year, which is something completely different. Um, so it's better to specify specifically that you want day part, you want to get the year of today's date. Um, and that'll give you the what you're actually trying to trying to pull to begin with. So be explicit. So to wrap things up today, pretty much sequels hard. Um, it's definitely something that you want to spend some time looking at, learning about, because it is hard. Um, you don't want to get the thing, get things that you don't mean to, especially if you don't know that you're getting incorrect things. Um, SQL itself has become a lot more capable uh, over the years. Uh, however, it, it also, because in that capability, it has gotten a lot more complicated than it used to be. It's also a completely different different language to learn. The, again, the syntax it doesn't uh, it doesn't behave like most programming languages. It's not top to bottom um, read. Um, it does some of the things that it does. It does incredibly well. Some of the things like like uh, text manipulation. It that that should be done um, in your application. Text manipulation. SQL is not great at that, but it's not intended to be great at that. So just just really look at what it is that you want to do. And, and the best thing, again, I said it earlier, that, that it's probably not always good to be curious. It, it's really, that's not true. It really is always good to be curious about things. You just have to watch out who you tell what you're curious about. 
Uh, because then, like I said, you, unless you really want to be the subject matter expert and find yourself becoming a a, 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 a Visual Basic six developer, <laughs> just because you ask the right questions to the wrong people, uh, just but be curious. Learn learn as much as you can about this stuff to make sure again that you're getting the the right stuff and you're not causing yourself troubleshooting problems further down the line. Again, there's so much that that. I that, that can be uh, involved in SQL, and I've barely, barely even touched the very surface of the things that can be uh, talked about. Uh, some of the other things that, that you can do, again, there's, there's in the age of the internet, there's, there's anything, anything online. You can find whatever knowledge you want to know. Uh, Microsoft uh, for SQL Server has done a great job of, of their books. They've got their entire book sets online. Uh, MySQL has incredibly good reference uh, manuals. Uh, I know the Postgres has got some good documentation. Everything's got really good documentation, uh, official documentation. Um, some of the things, some of the other things, if you want to play with different versions of SQL, uh, two of the sites that I use quite regularly to just do throwaway stuff, I use SQL Fiddle, uh, which is a US-based one. Um, that has uh, MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, SQLite, and MySQL Server, or sorry, MS SQL Server. And then I also use DB Fiddle, which is a UK-based one. Uh, it's got a lot more engines. Um, if you really wanted to dig into some DB2 stuff, um, that's that's the place to do it. Um, but because it is UK-based, you have to remember that their default date settings are not like the U.S., unless you're not in the U.S. Um, so the dates may not look right. Another really good asset that I've found um, just to do some practice uh, with is, is SQL, SQL Murder Mystery. Uh, it was put together by a, uh, a group of, of college students to basically, they, they took some, some real life data and, and you're able to run different queries against it to actually solve a, a case. Um, a kind of like a whodunit. So there's a little bit of fun that goes along with it. Um, some of the people that you should definitely follow, definitely follow Aaron Bertrand. He is an incredibly smart guy, um, especially his bad habits posts. Uh, he goes through a lot of things that, that uh, developers have done uh, that, that they may not realize they were doing with the database. And then you've also got uh, Brent Ozar, who is a fantastic resource, too. Uh, Kendra Little has some really good uh, training videos. Some of her stuff is older. She started blogging some newer stuff now, uh, but, but she's really good. And then Kevin Klein is also very smart. But there's always also the SQL, fam SQL family on Twitter. Uh, if you have a question, you can easily ask it there. Uh, and then there's just... You could just type SQL into to Google search or, or Bing search, and you'll find out so many other resources. There's there's a lot of information. But again, and I cannot stress this enough, don't test in production, please. You'll, you'll thank me for it later. And that's all I have. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everybody. Hey, sorry, I had to <clears throat> bring myself back in. Thank you for that. So I, um, there were a couple questions earlier, although I think many of them got answered. If you look in the bottom of the list of questions, there's one from two back from Doug Gibson asking a question. I'll put it up on the screen. They have some pretty good uh, documentation of what uh, versions are compatible with each other. Um, I'm not. I'm honestly not sure if it's. I I know that they did used to do two. They about two versions was the safest uh, for for doing. I'm guessing for for the upgrades. I know that that I went from 2008 all the way up to 2016 uh, in the last uh, the conversion that I did, which was one, two, three, ver four versions up. Um, so it, they, they usually have a, they have a pretty good uh, documentation of what versions are compatible uh, for a direct upgrade to the others. 
that was a quick did I read that question correctly? Well, I want to ask a question about that, Doug. You said, does it limit imports? And what did you mean by imports? So while we wait for him to answer that question. Oh, I gotcha. Go ahead and look through. Well, actually, let me say to everybody, everybody, if you have a question that didn't get answered, then please go ahead and ask it again now so that he can see it while he's focused on these. Because there's a lot of there was a lot of chat and we don't want to have him looking through all of those. And even I don't want to pick one out if it's already been answered. So, again, when Curtis says stored procedures are usually the gotchas, I think he might be saying <laughs> when they've upgraded from one version of SQL Server to another, perhaps. But I still want to know from Joseph, what did he mean by imports? Like, did you mean restoring a database from an old version? Because an import is not something that I think has a direct thing. But anyway, do you see any other questions there? Restoring a backup or database files from an older version into a new version. There you go. So, you know, like Sean said, it's it's just going to vary depending on the version that you're on. But I think you're going to find you could do a restore from a pretty old version. And then don't forget yeah, that going, going from it. 2008 to 2016, and not 2008 R2, but 2008. That was that was a pretty big jump. There were there were a little bit of things that I had to do, but but it was mostly a very simple upgrade. Uh, there were some checking. There were some things that were allowed in 2008 that weren't allowed in 2016, but those were fixable. But they and could was, be they could be upgraded. I was about to add. That, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm waiting for you to be done. <laughs> sorry, are you done? Okay. I was just going to say everybody should be aware that at least especially with SQL Server, there's also the issue of the database's compatibility level. So in yes. Management Studio, you can right click on the database, go to properties, and there's a compatibility level. So even if you're on SQL 2019, I was helping somebody just last week or this week who was running a database on SQL 2019, and it was still set to SQL 2008 compatibility mode, which that may be what they need to do, or it may be what they don't want to do. And that's just, again, something that people should investigate for themselves. And I've said that in a couple of the answers is that people often want answers and they want, you know, best practices. And I just, from my experience, helping people with troubleshooting every day, there aren't very many clear answers and best practices. Usually right? <laughs> something that may work for even most people may not work for you. So it, especially these kind of questions, they were things that often depend on what database you're using, what version of the database you're using. And when it comes to Cold Fusion, what version of the database driver you're using from Cold Fusion, because those drivers yes. are updated as new versions of CF come out. So it, some of these things are just hard. Um, when Joseph, you say, oh, okay, so you did change the compatibility level and it really helped a slow query. Good to hear. Good to hear. Yes. Yeah, there were there were a lot of changes, especially from especially in 2016 and forward. There were a bunch of speed improvements there. But yeah, that that upgrade that I did from 20 uh, 2008 to 2016, the the database itself was actually built in 2000. Uh, our 2000 it was built in 2000 had to be upgraded in 2005 compatibility level, and so it was running in 2008 on 2005 compatibility level. So I had to upgrade the compatibility level to the 2008 before I could upgrade it because 2008 is the minimum that 2016 lets you have. So yes, compatibility level is very important and can it have it can do some very strange things to what your system previously did. You just have to look for those those issues before you do that kind of upgrade. Definitely worth it though. So I don't see anybody there asking any questions again. So let's say this will be your last chance. Ask your questions now if you have them or share your comments. And thanks for the comments people have shared. And thank you, Sean, for the talk so far. I didn't get a chance to say that earlier. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. You betcha. I'm happy to have you. And Curtis... Um, expressed interest in a topic that I said if he or anybody else wanted to give that talk, they're welcome. So we're always open. So there's a question from Curtis. Have you played with the new JSON query capability? A little bit. Uh, that's definitely some, well, some of our other groups have, have worked on that a lot harder. I just I honestly haven't had a need for it yet. It's, it's something that, that 
I haven't dug into yet. Um, other than basically, again, just reading about it going, oh, that looks really cool. Let me see if I can figure out a way to use it. No, okay. It still looks very cool. <laughs> I don't want to create myself a way to use it if I don't have to, but. Well, that's that's what I'm on. I'm on 2016, so yes. There's, there's again, there's been a lot of updates in, in the, the between 2016 and 2019 uh, right now. All right. Well, it looks like this might be it for the questions people are asking. So maybe we can let you go earlier. Yep. Yep. And thanks everybody for your comments. Thanks again, Sean, for your giving the talk and the recording will be available. Actually it's available already. It's a live stream, but as soon as we're done, the, it'll be available as a recording that people can start over. And um, the chat won't be there. Let me, let me get to that in a second. The chat, from this won't be there right away. For some reason, it takes a half a day for the chat to appear. So just be calm. It'll come there later. Drew asked, is Adobe still stopping support for TF 2016 this month? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. It was last week. And now let me just say about that. So we're talking about updates to Cold Fusion. There, you know, CF 2016 is now officially five years old. And this was the month that for years has been in the page about when do end of life happen for adobe products you can see it says that cf 2016 was due to end this month they don't ever change that <laughs> so the answer is yes what i will say is that there had like last year or two years ago whatever when the last time this happened there was another update that came out a couple like even months after it's because they had already been working on it and they just were nice guys and they let it out so there may be one but officially updates for cf 2016 ended this month like on the 17th, I believe. Uh, I see there's been some more. Okay, cool. Sharing. So, yeah, good. Awesome. All right. Anything else from you? I, I see your comment for about the, the connection pooling. That's something that I, like I said, I, I yeah. said I needed to review that last sure, time sure, I did sure. this. And sure. I, I still never got around to it. To it. So yeah. Maybe I should actually do it. Well, I'm just saying it's probably not a big deal, but if somebody wondered, they can definitely find out. There's ways to find out if connections are being created. You can monitor it in right. Fusion Reactor. You can monitor it in the database. You can even monitor it in some ways with Cold Fusion. It's just a little harder. But uh, but yeah, if you want to take a moment to look through the chat and see if there's anything else you want to <laughs> talk about, we can wait a moment. And it is absolutely Curtis's fault that I'm a developer. So <laughs> and do you want to explain the relationship? Because that's not clear. <laughs> That's my little brother. There you go. We didn't know, but you saw I thanked him. So, yeah, he he uh, he invited me to come help him be a developer when I was still a pilot, and then he wouldn't let me go. So it's completely his fault. <laughs> Okay, so it doesn't look like there's any outstanding comments that you want to comment on, Sean. Um, look at them, but no, I don't see any unless anybody has anything that, that I missed. Right. No, I'd asked that earlier and nobody did reply. So we can go ahead and call it and let you get on with the rest of your day. And thanks everybody for coming on. And you know, you can continue to reach out to Curtis through his Twitter account. Um, remind everybody what that was. I, it might be on the slide. There you go. Code Food Monkey. There you go. So you can reach out to him that way if you have questions. And you can, <laughs> I'll let you answer that. You can also ask questions on the chat in the YouTube channel, but Sean wouldn't get notified of that unless he's watching it. So um, best to reach out to him directly. But yeah, so there you go. Did you have any response to that last question? To, am I crazy? Yes, probably. <laughs> there you go. Aren't we all <laughs> these days? All right, definitely, cool. Definitely strange career choice, but yes. Yeah. Life can be funny that way. All right, well, let's go ahead and right. wrap it up. And we will uh, look forward to another one. If you ever have it, just let us know. That was great. Thank you so right, much. Tom. You bet. And so long, everybody. Talk to you all later.